Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with talented jazz pianist and educator Jeremy Siskin. These days, he splits his time between being a musician and a professor, and he's a very busy cat. He spoke with Neon Jazz about his upcoming gig at the Take 5 Coffee Bar on July 25, 2015, along with doing some guest teaching at the University of Kansas. He has also just released a new album called Housewarming, featuring the great Kurt Elling. A lot of ground was covered with Jeremy in this interview, so please dig it, my friends. Well, let me go ahead and start off here and ask you, what has been going on with you lately? Uh, wow, that's, that's a broad question. <laughs> um, I'm a full-time college professor, which means over the summer, um, I kind of get to do a lot of different things. So um, I'm actually going to be in Kansas to do some teaching over at uh, the university in Lawrence. Um, I'm doing some teaching with the New York Voices, um, and I'm doing some touring with my uh, trio, which is kind of an unusual trio. It's a uh, voice and one guy who plays clarinet, bass clarinet, and saxophone, and then piano. So um, we did 17 gigs in June, and we have another 12-gig uh, tour planned in August. Very cool. So talk to me about where you grew up. Where did you grow up? I'm from Southern California, um, okay. a little bit south of L.A. So was there a jazz scene there? Was there a level of that area that kind of lent to you loving jazz? Well, actually, this is a funny story um, because um, the high school that I went to wasn't an arts high school or anything like that, but it kind of always had a really good music program. And so at the gig on, um, on the 25th, um, well, so it so happens that Kansas uh, jazz stalwart Matt Otto uh, went to the same high school that I did, um, oh, okay. like 20 years earlier. And <laughs> we met and we started playing a little bit, and then we discovered that we went to the same high school, which was really, really strange. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was close enough to the L.A. scene where I could access um, some of that. Um, and there's a little bit of a scene, um, particularly a really good music education scene down where I was. Um, but not not so much music happening. So talk to me about your latest project, Housewarming. Talk to me about the CD, the creative energy, the folks that are on, and kind of what you're doing to promote it right now. Yeah, so um, so as I mentioned, Housewarming is kind of an unusual trio. It's uh, modeled after the British singer Norma Winston, who has this um, group of clarinet, piano, and voice. Um, and the way that I see the music is that it's kind of, somewhere in between um, jazz, obviously, uh, chamber music because of the instrumentation, um, and the singer-songwriter movement because I write, I write most of the songs and there's kind of an emphasis on the sort of confessional, poetic songs that you might hear from a Paul Simon or a Joni Mitchell or a Nick Drake or somebody like that. Um, so the other players on the album um, are Lucas Pino, who plays saxophone and clarinet. Um, Nancy Harms is the main singer. And then I have three guests. Um, Kurt Elling, the jazz legend, uh, yeah. Peter Eldridge from the New York Voices, and uh, w the wonderful Kendra Shank. So really excited that they all agreed to sing my songs. Right on. So you're coming to Take 5, July 25th. Talk to me a little bit about how this all kind of came about. You said you're going to go to KU for a little bit. Talk to me about your trip to Missouri and Kansas and what's in store along with Take 5. Yeah, um, so I've been teaching at uh, at KU uh, for both the, uh, their jazz camp and uh, they have a thing called the International Institute for Young Musicians, which mostly brings um, some really phenomenal classical pianists uh, to the campus. So I've gotten to know a lot of the faculty really well, and we've enjoyed playing with each other. So I thought while I'm out there this year, um, I would uh, make an opportunity for us to uh, actually perform out in uh, in the Kansas City area. So it's going to be Matt Otto playing saxophone, Brandon Draper playing drums, and uh, Ben Leifer playing bass. Wonderful. So uh, there will be some some original music, some standards, um, and just kind of I hear such great things about the Kansas City scene. I'm interested to uh, to see one of its best clubs. Right on. Yep, it's one of the premier. So l let me dig a little bit more into your history as a pianist. You won the 2012 Nottingham International Jazz Pianos Competition. You were second at the Montreux. What does it mean to be a part of these competitions and to win the accolades? How does that help you as a person and a performer? 
Yeah, I mean, the competitions have been great for a number of reasons. Um, of course, uh, music is not a competition, and sometimes these things can be destructive uh, musically. <laughs> Um, but there are, they offer a lot of opportunities too. Um, for me, prime, the best opportunity is to have an op, to have the, uh, the chance to meet and exchange ideas with your peers. Um, particularly, uh, those two competitions were in Europe. And so I got to meet people from all over the globe, many of whom had, you know, very different, very different, uh, aesthetics, uh, very different influences than I had. Um, and, you know, there's always been, I think it's very different between jazz and classical competitions. In the jazz competitions, there's always this, great camaraderie and we're always swapping records and here check this out have you practiced this um you know um I, I have a really good friend now from the island of mauritius who's a great jazz pianist and i actually helped to organize his first gig in the states so for me the best thing about it is the camaraderie um also i think it's just good to have that kind of goal to to have something to work towards um i think so often especially these days it's easy to get complacent about what you can do and what your skill level is um, but when you're, you know, when you're going toe to toe, head to head with, uh, with these great musicians, uh, you can't be faking it. You can't be bringing anything less than, you know, your absolute most refined, most uh, inspired performances. So, um, it's helped me really develop my artistic voice. Um, and of course my technique and those kinds of things. Absolutely. So over your career, you've gotten around quite a bit. You played at Carnegie Hall, Kennedy Center. You've gone to Japan, Switzerland, Thailand, England, India, China. What what has it been like to go to so many of these esteemed places and so many spots on the planet to give them your music? Um, I mean, it's 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 a huge honor and a thrill more than anything else. Um, the the latest place uh, of interest that I was that actually didn't make it onto that list is uh, Tunisia. Um, we were just out there for International Jazz Day. And we presented the first big band concert that happened in Tunisia in the last 25 years, which was kind of a thrill. Um, and they they brought about five American musicians over, and we did clinics for a week with Tunisian musicians. And one of them said to me, um, you know, to, to have you American musicians here, it's like heaven for us. Um, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's so easy. We have so much access in this country to educational materials, to CDs, I mean, you know, there's probably too much access to recorded music. Um, but some of these places uh, like Thailand, like Tunisia, like China, um, they don't have things in their languages um, and they don't have real experts in the music coming to work with them. So it's always just so rewarding to be able to get out um, and give give people something that they're really hungry for. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you more hyper-specific to the jazz that has moved you in your life. You know, there's albums that you'll listen to growing up in your formative years that really kind of open up some curtains for you. Was there a jazz album or albums that really, you were like, wow, this made me see the light? Definitely. I mean, it's it's hard to narrow it down. Um, you know, uh, people might not suspect of me who know my style, um, but I actually grew up listening to a lot of Oscar Peterson um, and, I, you know, just wanted to be an Oscar Peterson clone when I was growing up. So, you know, We Get Request and Night Train, those really great Oscar Peterson albums um, were really influential to me. Um, but for me, a real turning point was when I heard uh, my mentor, Fred Hirsch's uh, music, first um, in Live at the Village Vanguard. And then the one that really kind of sealed the deal for me was uh, Songs Without Work, which is a three album set. Um, and those really kind of made me see the possibilities at the piano beyond um, just the very traditional jazz styles, the way that he kind of mixed the artistry and the diversity of classical music um, along with the freedom of jazz really changed my life. Yeah, interesting. So in, in your, you're now you're not only a musician, you're a teacher. Who has taught you the most in your life? Wow. Um, so... Yeah, I did. Uh, so Fred, I'll, I'll stick with him, has kind of been my mentor for the last eight to ten years. Um, and, you know, he's uh, some of his students call him Fred Harsh instead of Fred Hirsch. Uh, because <laughs> he's really he's really brutally honest and uh, but in in the in the best way. And he's kind of humbled me um, in terms of where I am in my journey and, you know, what I really want to do with music. I think other teachers are 
might uh, focus on details of piano playing, which are important and Fred talks about as well. Um, but I, I'll never forget my first lesson that came in. He said, wow, you're a really good pianist. So what? What are you saying? What are you doing that's new? What are you doing that's individual? Um, and it was something that I really needed to hear at that time in my life. And, you know, it's been a quest that I've been after ever since. Interesting. Um, so what's the greatest thing for you about waking up every day? Ooh. Um, for me, like, every day is so different. Um, I get to compose a lot of educational materials um, with my relationship with Hal Leonard. So I might be doing that. I'm doing a lot of songwriting for my group, so I might be writing a song. I might be teaching classical students. I might be teaching jazz students. I might be playing a jazz gig. It might be solo piano, or it might be very artsy, or it might be very swinging. Um, so um, I kind of really just enjoy the diversity of what I do um, and the way that teaching and playing kind of feed into each other, that I'll do some teaching that I get really excited about and have all these new ideas, and then I apply them to my playing, or I'll play a gig and you know, come up with this really interesting way of thinking about something, and then I'll go and tell my students about it. Um, and so there's this really nice self-propelling cycle of being a musician who's really an active educator as well. Right on. Uh, why do you love jazz so much? Um, why do I love jazz so much? For me, it's the freedom of it, you know, um, the danger of it, the possibility that anything can happen. Um and uh, the opportunity that every jazz musician has to really extend the limits of what jazz is, um, as a pianist, to extend the limits of what jazz piano is, what you know, what can be done at the piano as an improviser, um, and also, of course, the collaborative aspect, to come in and play with guys in a different city, um, and they'll make you play differently. And so you keep discovering new sides of yourself, new things that you can do, um, because other people are pushing you um, to be more excellent, to be different, or to uh, uh, to really pursue something that you might not usually pursue. Yeah. So let me ask you this. If you could get into a time machine and go see any jazz gig at any time in history, where would you go, and who would you want to see? Oh, man. Um, you know, I, I don't think I could pass up seeing Miles at some point, but the question is which... Which era? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, well, so one of the one of the albums that, that's uh, maybe my favorite Miles album is Round About Midnight, um, yeah. which is with that great quintet with Coltrane, Red Garland, and so maybe something from that era. Yeah, to see Miles and Train together, I mean, who could pass that up? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know, everybody that you've ever played for and all of your friends and your family, and everybody has an idea – of who you are and, and how they define who you are. Tell me how you define yourself. Who are you? Um, geez, I feel like I'm talking to my therapist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to me, I'm, I guess I identify most as a pianist before I think about labels like jazz or classical. To me, playing the piano is very fundamental to what I do. Um, Maybe maybe if I, if I had two words, I'd say a creative pianist, <laughs> a pianist who like likes to create things. Um, yeah, but that's hard. Yeah, I don't know. who wa who wants to limit themselves in that way? Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask you this: Let's say we hook up in ten years and we talk, and I ask you first thing, first off, what's been going on? What are you going to want to tell me happened? What are you going to be excited to talk about? Um, you know, for me, uh. A lot of it is just going to be uh, collaborating with different kinds of artists, continuing to expand that network of people that I play with, um, and just performing more and more and more, um, getting to other interesting places, uh, both geographically and musically. Um, and um, I think I'm getting more interested in the songwriting element, and more people are getting interested in playing and singing my songs. So I hope. Uh, I get to continue and expand uh, doing that besides the playing. Um, yeah, but mostly just playing with a wide variety of musicians and being able to share this music with a lot of people. Right on. 
that's a perfect way to end right there. And enjoy time in uh, Kansas City and Kansas. Fantastic. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over America, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jeremy for his time and jazz story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.